For the last part of the lecture topic today, we're going to talk just a little bit about using viruses and specifically quantifying viruses in the microbiology laboratory. And we'll say a few words about prions. Prions, remember, are the other type of acellular microbe. So we do grow viruses in the microbiology laboratory sometimes, but it's important to remember that the way that we grow viruses is very different from the way that we grow bacteria in the laboratory and, and other types of microbes. And that's because viruses are not alive. Viruses are not cellular. So in order to make more viral particles in the laboratory, you have to grow host cells first and then infect those host cells with viral particles so that you get more viral particles produced. So you have to grow host cells, you have to culture cells in the laboratory in order to get more viral particles made. So cell culture or even tissue culture, remember a tissue is just a, a collection of cells that all function together. Um, that kind of culture is very difficult. Um, it's, it's fraught with uh, complications. Um, sometimes when we're studying viruses, rather than trying to grow host cells to infect, instead we use entire organisms. We use laboratory types of organisms in order to infect the whole organism with the virus um, and, and get more virus produced that way. We're going to talk just a little bit about um, using cells, using cell culture to grow virus um, and doing what's called a plaque assay. Now this is done primarily with bacteriophages, so the virus that infects bacteria. So it involves the techniques, some of them, that we've been talking about in the course so far. What you're looking at in this picture over here on the right is an auger plate that had bacterial culture spread over its surface using that hockey stick tool that we looked at in a previous video. So remember, when we use the hockey stick, we're going to take some culture, some bacterial culture, and we're going to spread it all over the surface of the auger plate, nice and evenly. And what we will get from that is bacterial cells growing all over the surface of the plate. You don't get colonies. You don't get little groups of cells. You get a nice, what's called a lawn of cells. And that's what you're looking at on this plate. It looks kind of cloudy when you look at it quickly. And that's because the auger is just covered with bacterial cells growing. So we spread bacterial cells all over the surface of the plate. And we also spread viral particles over the surface of the plate. And then the plate goes in the incubator to allow the bacterial cells to grow and hopefully to make more virus for us. Um, when you take the plate out of the incubator, if you've been successful, you get something like this. Now you have to look at this plate very closely. You have to really focus in on it to see this. But there are little circles all over this plate that are clear. So there's a, a cloudy bacterial lawn over the surface of the plate, but then there are these little circles, if you can see them, all across in different areas on the plate. These are what are called plaques. What you're looking at, what a plaque is, is an area on the plate where there are no bacterial cells. So what has happened in that spot is the cells that were there, where we spread them, have been infected with virus. The virus has been replicated by the host cell, and then the virus has exited and killed the host cell. So while the rest of the bacterial cells that weren't infected, 
while they grew into the lawn that we see, where the cells were killed, there's no growth. There's a clear spot. So everywhere there's a plaque, a bacterial cell or cells were infected and then killed. It's a lytic zone, an area where lysis has occurred and cells have been killed. Now, we can quantify viruses as we produce them in the lab. We can count them. We can enumerate them by doing what's called a plaque assay. Essentially, what we're doing is we're determining the number of plaques that are on our plate, and we can record that as plaque-forming units, PFUs similar to colony forming units, CFUs. If you recall, the colony forming unit number is not actually a count of cells. It's similar to, it's, it's analogous to the cell number, but we can't make a, an absolute one-to-one -one comparison between CFU and, and bacterial cells. The same is true of these plaques. It's analogous to viral particle number, but it's not one-to-one. Uh, uh, -one. So it's an, it's an indirect way of counting viral particles in a sample. Now, the reason it's not one-to-one, -one, well, there are a couple of reasons. In other words, the reason that everywhere there's a plaque, we cannot say, well, there was a viral particle there. Number one, the PFU number is always going to be lower than the actual count of viral particles that went onto that plate. Multiple viral particles can go into one bacterial cell. So you can get a plaque where a cell was lysed, where it's not that you had one viral particle, you had several viral particles there. It's just that they all went into the same cell. So, so that's part of the reason. We can't do a one-to-one -one comparison. The other reason we can't is because of this. Just because there are viruses in with those bacterial cells, that doesn't mean you're going to get a viral particle into every bacterial cell. If you did, the whole plate would be one big plaque, right? And we know it's not. Some of the bacterial cells don't get infected, and some of them grow. It turns out that viruses vary tremendously in how efficient they are at getting into cells. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at a virus like the norovirus, and remember the norovirus causes that terrible gastrointestinal disease, very, um, very infectious virus, very contagious. A person would need to get exposed to tens of particles in order to get infected with norovirus. That's a very small number of particles. You'd only need to, to get tens, so maybe, you know, actually 10 of them or 20 or 30. You'd only have to get those into your mouth or um, into your gastrointestinal system to come down with a norovirus infection. Compare that with flu. You would have to pick up thousands of influenza particles in order to get the flu. The influenza particle is just less efficient at getting into our cells than the norovirus particle is. So how well, how easily, or how, um, how difficult it is for a virus to gain entry into a host cell plays a part in um, the infection of host cells. So again, we use plaque assays to determine, uh, to quantify the number of viral particles in a sample, but it is not a, a one to one. We cannot say that, oh, there's 50 plaques, so that means there were 50 viral particles at those spots. You, you can't do that. But it is a representation. It's a number we can use as an indirect measurement of viral particles. Now, along those lines, I want to mention this term, titer. You hear this word a lot. 
you're hearing it right now with regards to the pandemic coronavirus. Um, people talking about viral titer or also antibody titer. What a titer is, is uh, as it relates to viral particles, it's the number of infectious virions that are in a volume of fluid. So if we drew a blood sample from you and we determined how many viral particles were in, let's say, an ml of your blood, that would be your viral titer. One of the viruses that um, we use titers with a lot is human immunodeficiency virus. And that's because right now, at least, there's no cure for HIV, there's no vaccine for HIV, but there are treatments for HIV that allow infected people to live with HIV uh, chronically across their lifetime. So they often have blood drawn and they have titers calculated how many HIV particles there are per ml of their blood. And by knowing their titer, we can tell that infected person how likely it is that they're going to spread the virus, number one, and also how likely it is that they're going to come down with AIDS, with the disease that HIV causes. So titers are used in medicine to keep track of just how many viral particles are in a person's body. And as I said, you can also count antibodies against a virus in the blood and come up with an antibody titer. Um, that's for different purposes, of course, but um, that is a term that, um, that you should at least be familiar with. We're going to finish up today with just a few words about prions. So we're, we're finished discussing viruses. Remember that viruses are acellular, but they're still considered to be microbes. Prions are similar. They are acellular. They are not cells. They are not living things. And yet they're microscopic and they're infectious. So we do talk about them in a course like this. What a prion is, is actually a misfolded protein. The really frightening thing about prions is that they can trigger nearby proteins that are normal, that have folded normally, to go on and misfold. So the presence of a prion, a misfolded protein, in the body, particularly in the nervous system, can cause other normal proteins to go on and misfold. So that's why we speak about prions as being infectious or being capable of spreading. Now, we've spoken a little bit about how proteins need to fold in order to get into the correct shape to do the job that they're intended to do. We spoke about how in a living cell, there are chaperone proteins that help guide the string, the chain of amino acids that gets made, help it fold up into some three-dimensional shape so that it's a functional protein. So it's capable of going out into the cell wherever it's going to reside and performing a function for the cell. In order to do that job, the protein must be in that shape. It must be folded correctly. And there are processes in living cells that are there to get rid of misfolded proteins, to identify them and destroy them. But sometimes misfolded proteins persist. And certain misfolded, misfolded proteins are capable of causing disease. And unfortunately, they can be terrible diseases. What happens in a prion disease is that over time, this cascade of misfolding, this cascade of misfolded protein creation results in 
functional problems for the cell. If, if you have your proteins misfolded, then they're not able to do the job they were intended to do. And that means the cell can't function normally and the cell will die. So over time, in a prion disease, cells are dying. And because um, the prion diseases that we know, um, that we've studied, infect the nervous system, what that means is that cells are dying in the nervous system, neurons and other types of cells that you find, for example, in the brain are being destroyed and leaving literal, literal holes in the brain tissue. The brain starts to look like a sponge over time. And that's why these diseases are referred to as spongiform. They make the brain tissue look like a sponge. Um, obviously, you cannot um, survive if holes are being made in your brain. And people that um, develop prion diseases do succumb to it eventually. Unfortunately, it's a slow death and it is a miserable death because it affects the brain. Prion diseases are transmissible. Again, this is why we think of them as being infectious. Not only does a prion particle affect other normal proteins and turn them into prions, um, causing the disease to progress in the host, but that host can spread those prions to another host. Now, one of the most uh, sort of disgusting ways that prions are transmitted from person to person is through the consumption of nervous uh, system tissue. So in other words, if you eat brain and spinal cord that is infected with prions, those prions will then go on and, and um, infect your brain and spinal cord. And you might think, well, you know, I certainly don't eat brain and spinal cord, <laughs> but you actually uh, might. <laughs> um, there are cultures around the globe that do partake in certain forms of cannibalism. That's just a fact. And certainly um, in the last century, um, it was discovered that there were certain tribes around the world um, of peoples who partake in religious rituals where the brains of their deceased relatives were uh, are, are actually physically eaten, are consumed. Um, I can't tell you whether or not that still goes on today. I think lots of efforts have been made to educate those people um, to help them stop with that particular tradition because it's dangerous. Um, so one of the prion diseases that was discovered in humans is one called Kuru. I've got the name here. And um, Kuru was um, discovered to be caused by this religious practice of consuming the brains of your deceased relatives. And of course, there came a point where someone became infected with a prion disease and died of that prion disease. And when, when that person's family consumed his brain, they then came down with the prion disease and so on and so on until many members of the tribe succumbed to prion disease. Um, we learned a lot about prion disease from these unfortunate victims of Kuru. Um, another prion disease you may have heard of is mad cow disease. The formal name for mad cow disease is bovine spongiform encephalopathy. So bovine coming from cows, spongiform causing that sponge-like change in the brain, and encephalopathy, meaning brain disease, brain pathology. Mad cow disease has had um, has occurred in epidemics um, around the globe in in past years, um, including one a small epidemic here in the United States and in the United Kingdom. Um, mad cow disease was um, occurring in cattle because there was a time when cattle were fed. Um, in commercial in uh, commercial farms, cattle were being fed the remains of other cattle. 
Now, not entirely. I don't want you to think that cows were eating, you know, off of dead bodies of other cows. But certain parts of cows were being um, essentially harvested at slaughter. Um, just like we get a lot of our meat products from cattle, um, the meat and the bones and other materials from some cows and, and other cattle were being used to make you know, protein based feeds for cattle. So cattle were being fed to other cattle as protein sources. Um, what happened, we think, is that some of this uh, meat, some of this beef, got contaminated during slaughter with uh, cerebrospinal fluid and with cells from the central nervous system. Um, and in fact, there was a time when things like the brain and the spinal cord and other organs inside of cattle would be used again as a protein source or, or a fat source or a source of other nutrients in cattle feed. So at some point, and again, no one knows where, um, a cow was infected with a prion disease or developed a prion disease, got into that chain that slaughter chain got fed to other cows and sparked um, an epidemic of BSE and it's happened more than once we now have made changes so that we no longer feed um, cow or cattle material to other cattle we certainly don't allow the feeding of nervous tissue we don't allow nervous tissue to be harvested for feeding to other cattle. Um, that has stopped. And so we have not had an epidemic of mad cow disease in some time. But it has happened and it's been very scary because one of the things we know about prion diseases is that not only are they transmissible from animal to animal, but they're transmissible from species to species. And I'm sure you've heard about the cases where people have developed a prion disease by consuming the meat that came from a cow with prion disease. Um, that has happened. So in other words, cows that have developed mad cow disease have gotten into the food chain and humans have developed essentially mad cow disease by eating the cow. So yes. It is possible for prions to be transmitted from animal to animal to animal across species, which is why we have to be so careful now um, to keep those infected animals out of the food chain. Um, something else to know about prions is that they are very resistant to destruction, um, like spores, like bacterial spores. It's very hard to kill prions. What's different from the spores is that even autoclaving does not appear to destroy prions. So what that means is when a human is discovered to be suffering from a prion disease, and we don't see Kuru much anymore, but we do see a type of prion disease called CJD. Every once in a while, it's very rare. The CJD stands for Kruzfeld Jakob disease. And if you're curious about that disease, you can certainly Google it and read more about it. But CJD is what we think of as a spontaneously occurring prion disease. In other words, every once in a while, a person comes down with this prion disease. They have no history of eating human brain or anything. They have no history of eating animal tissue from an infected animal. Um, they just developed a prion disease randomly and spontaneously. Um, again, very rare, thank goodness. But they have the very characteristic lesions in their brains that we now recognize um, as a prion disease. If we operate on a person who is discovered to have CJD. So in other words, we go into the operating room, we do brain surgery, we diagnose them with a prion disease. 
all of the surgical instruments that were used on that person will be discarded after that surgery. And that's because we cannot trust that if we took those surgical instruments and we scrubbed them clean and we put them in the autoclave, we cannot trust that every single prion will be gone off of those surgical instruments. So because we often diagnose prion disease at surgery, any surgical instruments that touch that brain have to be discarded. Um, that's how resistant and scary prions are. Very, very resistant to destruction. The other scary thing about prion disease is this last one. Similar to HIV, prion diseases can have very long incubation periods. In other words, from the time that the animal, whatever, whatever animal it is, from the time it first gets exposed to the prion, from the time it first, let's say, consumes the prion, it can be years and years before it develops a prion disease. So that's really scary. It makes it very hard to determine how that animal got infected. It makes it very hard to trace back where the source of infection is. Um, prion diseases are very scary. Fortunately for us, fortunately for humans, fortunately for other animal species, um, they are still very rare. And like I said, while we have had sporadic outbreaks, of mad cow disease in different parts of the world, we seem to have gotten a handle on that because we have changed the types of feeding um, traditions that we use um, in that industry. This last slide I wanna share with you um, has two images on it. On the left-hand side, this is an artist's depiction of both a normally folded version of a protein and a prion. Um, and over here on the right, this is a section of tissue that was taken from the brain of a person who died of a prion disease. Let's start over here on the left. This is a picture, a drawing, I'll say, of a protein. Now remember what a protein is. It starts off as a long chain of amino acids attached to each other. And then inside the cell, that long chain of amino acids gets folded up into a three-dimensional structure. So this sort of beige yellow colored chain, this, this was the whole thing was once this long yellow chain. And then the cell folded it up. In some areas, it took it and made this helical green structure. In some areas, it made this flattened kind of region that you see in blue. In some areas, the amino acids were just left as sort of an open loop or a strand. But you end up with this. You end up with a three-dimensional structure, which we call a protein. Now, this particular protein that's depicted in this picture can misfold under certain circumstances, sort of random circumstances, and turn out like this. You can't see the individual amino acids or anything, but you can see that this thing is a different shape than this thing. There are these three green sort of helixes in this protein, but in the misfolded version, there are only two. There's this one little area where it folded into this flat sheet that you see in blue. Over here, that sheet has gotten much wider, much bigger. This is the prion form of this. This is the misfolded version of this. Now, not all misfolded proteins are prions. There are only some prion, there are only some misfolded proteins that can function as prions. Remember what a prion can do. A prion can cause other normally folded proteins to misfold. So, just because a protein folds incorrectly does not mean it's a prion. It has to have that characteristic about it. It has to be able to then cause other proteins to misfold in order to be a true prion. Now take a look at the picture over here. 
most of what you're looking at over here in this pinkish purple color you can ignore the purple areas that you're looking at here and here those are nuclei of cells we're in the brain so there are neurons in here nerve cells and there are also glial cells there are supportive cells in here what i want you to look at though is the white everywhere you see a white circle there is nothing there that is an empty hole in the brain of this poor person who died of a prion disease this is why they are called spongiform diseases because they literally create holes in the brain